Okay, we're going to get into Paul, but I, we're going to start to focus on the overlap and the resolution of the BCAD problem that we have, which actually isn't the problem. It's indicative of two bisecting Bible timelines. So it's really interesting how this works. We stopped at Mary with the Magnificat, and we noticed how she stopped right in here, going future to figure out the payback on Abraham super maturing 54 years prior to the end of the 2100 year allotment owed the Gentiles, which today is called 2000 for shorthand, and is known by the Jews as the Age of Desolation. You can Google on that. So what she was trying to do is figure out how this, that was going to work. So she must have known something about how he might die early. I mean, this is when he announces himself. And, and this is when he was supposed to die. That was the 62nd week of Daniel. That was the 1,000th anniversary of David's death at age 77, not 70. Which is one reason scholars don't understand the Daniel timeline. But she does, and she's saying, okay, well, the 54 years gets paid back here. Now, the thing is, is that Christ would be age 56 at that time. See, you got the four years here. This is really the end of 4 BC, so you add only three years. So that's a total of his age 56. Now, at the time Mary's doing it, it's 5 BC, and Augustus is in power. At the time Mary's doing this, there was a raging debate going on in Rome and all throughout the Roman Empire about how do you date Roman time. The main school, the main school of thought at that time, when Mary's talking, was dating Rome from what we would call 750 B.C. There was a second school called by a guy named Varro, who was a famous prose writer, who Augustus liked a lot. And he instead came up with what we would call 753 BC as the birth of Rome. Augustus would accept his Varro's idea based on what we would call 753 BC. Therefore, you have a, an overlap, even if you're Mary and you're accounting on Roman basis, you've got two accounting dates you've got to track to. You've got to track to the popular one, which is based on 750 BC, and you've got to trace back to Varro, who was favored by Augustus when she's talking which is 753 BC. Okay, this is the Roman AUC system and the question that was raging in Rome at the time was whether or not you date based on what we would call 753 as the birth of Rome or 750. 750 was being used by most of the populace. So if she's composing, and you know, Luke is putting this in scripture, so it was real important and known as important in scripture at the time. Then she's got to date his age on two time tracks. So what she neatly does is she has a second time track, which is based on 750 BC in our terms, reimburse for Abraham. Okay? And based on the Veronic which was being approved by Augustus at that time, calendar, well then that would mean that she was really at, you know, four years earlier, really three years earlier, because this is end of year. Very last week of the Roman year this happens. So she's calculating based on the Veronic calendar. So she's taking both calendars into view. Okay? You with me on that? So that's Mary, that's where she leaves off. Christ age 56 on two different Roman calendar time tracks. Well, Paul's going to do the same thing. And you've seen me do this before. Alright. Paul is starting his dateline.
Christ would have been 56 when Paul writes. That tallies to Mary's chronology using the Veronic calendar. It's real important. Remember, we just saw that you'd have to date Christ's birth back three years if you're using Vero's calendar, which was approved by Augustus at the time she writes. By the time Paul writes, when Christ would have been age 56, where Mary left off, that same calendar was made law under Claudius. Claudius had died in 54. Okay? And Toisepu, that's the end of our dear boy Caligula, when Claudius came into power. When Claudius came into power, he wanted to restore. <coughs> Excuse me. I ate some popcorn. It went down wrong. He wanted to restore Roman ways. He kicked the Jews out of Rome. He kicked the Christians out of Rome. Not necessarily the Jews. And he was on this big restore Roman dignity campaign okay until he dies okay so the Vero calendar which dated the Roman AUC calendar backwards three years was law by the time Paul writes so that's where our 4 BC really comes from there is a similar mistake that was made by a guy named Dionysius under Pope Gregory in the 6th century AD. But my guess is <coughs> that Dionysius recognized this three-year variance and just flat cut out four years from Augustus in order to align to the Bible. There's no indication that any of them knew anything about the meter. But there were other ways to know the timeline. And so our so-called 4 BC birth of Christ really is sourced in the controversy in Rome over whether the Rome was born in what we would call 750 BC, which was the more popular opinion, okay, or whether it was seven, what we would call 753 BC, which was Vero. Vero Flat made that up. There were three years of civil war that they just m made up names of consuls in order to, to, to you know, pad the number of years because they had a three-year anomaly in their own accounting. And all that was happening when Mary wrote. So Paul's just following convention. In either event, Christ himself would be 56. You see the point? Now there's more to the story than that that's even more intriguing, but just that much you can tell right now. And I put links about the problem with the Vero calendar versus um, the 750 BC in the beginning of this episode 12A. 12A, 12B, 12C. I think it, the links are in 12C. So you can look them up on the internet yourself and see it. Okay, this is a very well-known problem that was going on with the Roman calendar. All of our AB, ADBC dates are based on the Roman calendar, and specifically they're based on Varro, which became law under Claudius, which started right in here. That's 41. Okay, and then he dies about right here. Okay. I want to say he died in 54. I'm just guessing right now off the top of my head. Okay. And then Nero comes to power after him. So here's the beauty of this. All of these numbers are AD dates. Just read them straight AD like we do today. Okay. The conventional AD dates that, you know, Roman historians and most Christians use. Just read them like this. Don't do the plus three thing. Just read them in the conventional historical AD. You know, like we say, the, the more common history in Christianity is we say Christ died in 30 AD. Use that. Okay? The bio, I'll, I'll, I'll reconcile it to the three years later in the next video. But in this one, I just want to walk you through the numbers so you see how interesting it is 
for what Paul says and I covered this in detail in my GGS series 11 videos but I'm going to go through it in rapid fashion now 10 AD Augustus Caesar dies to Curio what you could call in all tenses and purposes end of 14 AD it's, it's, it's a question because there's a September fiscal year that's going on here they this is when Augustus dies he was deified. See, Lord, you get the play on words. Augustus dies there in English. We'll just use the English so you can follow it better. That's 14 AD when Augustus dies, and he dies in August, which is the end of the fiscal year at that time. So it would be, for, you know, their idea of beginning 15 AD, end of 14 AD. Okay? They deified him at his death. So he was called Lord. You see the word play? This is really biting how Paul does this. Okay. 37 AD was when our boy um, Tiberius dies. And that was the same year that our boy um, Pilate got recalled by Tiberius. And because Tiberius dies, Pilate didn't get punished. So, gee, that's a spiritual blessing, at least to Pilate. You see that? See the idea of spiritual blessing. See your your spiritual like in heaven. Okay. Then our boy Caligula dies right here. He thought he was a god. Okay. Well, God, the real God, is saying no, not quite, because this is ep uranias, which means in heaven. But he only but Caligula dies right here in the middle at Epu. Didn't quite make Uranias. Didn't quite make it to heaven. See, Paul's sarcasm is biting. Now, I'm using real Roman history you can test. And this will be much more familiar to you. <coughs> okay? And of course, Christ himself went to heaven. Get this. See, 27 AD. Christ dies in 30 AD. En passe. In all. In every. Okay, well, you know what? This is the word spiritual. Or blessing. Yeah, he's dead here. With eh. We'll see, like you can't. Every. With ev. Yeah, with every. At the word, when the word every ends, that's 30 AD. Okay, so now he's with every spiritual blessing, alright, because he's in heaven. See the word play? I covered this in more detail in the GGS videos, but I just want to give you a sense of the flavor of how the meter and the text interact with history you're more familiar with. Okay? Okay, so our boy Cla Claudius takes over here. Okay? And, and he's all concerned about Uranius at that point. That's his big thing is to take Roman ba Rome back to the gods and away from Caligula who'd sort of ruined it all. In Christoi, okay, and what does he do? What does what does Claudius do? He expels the Christians from Rome. Okay, so did he expel them by killing them? Well, then they'd be living in heaven in Christ. Did he expel them to the to the outer provinces? Okay, well then they're still living with Christ, but on earth. You see. See, every spiritual blessing together with those in heaven. In other words, those on earth and those in heaven are together. We're getting all the spiritual blessings while we're still on earth. So whether on earth, absent or present, with Christ, in heaven or on earth, we're together with. Okay? Because he's blessing everybody with every spiritual blessing together with those living in heaven via Christ. You see that isn't that cute? And then I want to say, if memory serves, that, Cal that Claudius dies in 54. So this is 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54. Okay, yeah, because Hamas is 54. Okay, so Claudius was elected to die by God. God elected to kill him in 54. He was poisoned by his wife whose son was Nero. Okay? So Nero was elected to come to power. 
us. And that's how Nero regarded himself. Nero also regarded himself as a god. And so this is 54, 56 AD, these last two syllables here. Is that cute or not? Okay. And Christ would have been age 56 at that point. So now Paul's going future. What if, and this is where he gets into it, and I cover this in detail in the document, what if the rapture occurs here? That was the first, people were trying to date set the rapture just like they're doing now. Okay, and Paul is going to tell you how if the rapture were to occur in these benchmark years, here's the character of the time at that time. Okay, 56, pregnant point of history. Remember, 56 benchmarked at the end of Psalm 90, 56 prominent in Isaiah, 56 is what Daniel had left out as his ending syllables. Mary ends her poem, therefore, at Christ age 56, which is where Paul picks up. So now we're going future. Okay, what about 10 years future? Christ died at age 33. At age 66, he would have been dead 33 years. That's pretty poetic time for him to come back. Okay, and if he comes back, we're going to say that we were in him from the founding of the world. Now, here's the satire on Rome. Nero, at that time, wanted to re-found Rome and call it Neropolis. So, this is satire against Nero also. Catabolis, foundation. Nero regarded himself as the foundation of Rome. He wanted to rename. He wanted to redo time, redo everything. Okay, well, that's a good time for the rapture to happen. And the thing that's even funnier about this, I wonder if Paul knew, two years after that benchmark, Paul would be dead. So Paul will be saying that. Right there. At Ine. Paul was pronounced holy, blemish-free at Ine, 68 AD. So he's, I, I don't know, is it, does he know that he's going to die then, even when he writes? But that's when he died. It was in the year of the four emperors. It was a few months before Nero died. Nero died about, I want to say January, March, might have been June of 69 AD. And that provoked the year of the four emperors. Okay, well, if that provoked the year of the four emperors, then looky here, 73, and we're going to be visiting this number again when we get into episode 13. That would be a good time for the temple to go down, see? It could have been the beginning of the rapture there and the end of the tribulation here, at which point we would all be hagius. Everybody. Okay? The temple, therefore, would have gone down, and it ended up going down. So that's 68, 69, 70 AD is when the temple really went down. So then the temple would have gone down mid-trib, just as Daniel 9.27 foretold. And of course it did go down that year. At which point, then a lot of people were expecting the rapture to occur, or not the rapture to occur, but the tribulation to end in 73. The temple really goes down here as a consequence of the year of the four emperors. That was ended by Titus. Vespasian finally was the, the third emperor, the fourth emperor to get into power. And then he had adopted Titus while Vespasian was still in Jerusalem with Titus. And then Titus had to go to Rome and he had to bring home dad a triumph. And that's why he did this thing, starting on Passover, ending on 9th Ave, boom, 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 114 days, end of temple. And that's where it ended. Okay, so then... Was that the tribulation? Was there three and a half years left? Well, Paul doesn't know. It could have started then. That could have been the end of the temple right in the mid-trib. And that could have been the end of the trib at Christ's age 73. So these are all what if the tribulation begins scenarios. Okay, well what if it doesn't begin then? What if instead Hagius, the holy temple, get the word play? What if the Holy Temple goes down in 73? Which would mean that the tribulation started at Hamas in 70 AD, year of the four emperors, as it turned out. And then the tribulation ends 
It's 77 and everybody's on Momus, blameless. See? You see how he's tracking? You see how pregnant these words are, tracking to the text? And now you can better understand the text. Okay? All right, well, what if it doesn't happen? Then what if the trib, what if the rapture happens in 77 instead? And ends in 84. See, and he's saying that that's very likely. Because all of a sudden he's he's metering that to a standalone clause of seven syllables. Well, then at the beginning of the tribulation we would what? Revelation 4? Be before him by his standard. Revelation hadn't been written yet, but when John talks back to, John is, all, is mapping to Paul here when he writes the Revelation. So, okay, we'd be before him by his standard. And we'd be by his standard at the end of the tribulation. We'd be of his standard riding back on those horses at the second advent. See? Isn't that cool? So it would be poetic if at Christ's age 77, between his age 77 and if at his age 77, the tribulation occurred. After all, David died when he was 77. So why not have, when Christ is 77, have the tribulation begin? And we're going to go through this more because Paul is actually mapping to these numbers um, in more than one way when he's tying back to Israel's history. Here, what he's doing is he's mapping out Roman and church history by these designations here, specifically to the Roman emperors and eventually to the rise of church. But what he's going to do, and it comes up starting here, See, this is what if 84 A.D., what if the rapture happens in 94 A.D.? 94 A.D. was the latest expected time for the temple to go down because under the old schedule of Israel, Christ was um, going to be 97 when the millennium was supposed to begin. So that's why he's using prorisas. And of course, that's what the mission thought he was. I'm, I'm kind of leaving out the Roman emperors here because i gotta get, I got to go fast. Okay. And at this point, this is where Trajan dies and Hadrian takes his place. And each time you get this Ada and Telematos, some emperor has died at the Tel, and the, the, the successor takes over at the Ada, and the successor always undoes the goal of his predecessor. The second time that happens is with Macrinus, and that's taken over by the Severans, and the third time it happens is with Diocletian, and that's undone by Constantine. Okay? This is the first time Paul uses what's called an anaphora, which is a repeated phrase that's used as a tracking device. It's kind of, it's similar to what in Greek is called chiasmus, where you're benchmarking off a section of text to make a, a, a separate internal um, set of points, bullet points really, to show a chronology or some kind of cause and effect relationship. And what he's doing starting in here, which is starting with um, Trajan, okay, 105 AD, okay, keyed off by Huiotesian because Trajan was part of the adoptive emperors. Sonship, adoption, you get the pun, that's why he's picking it. See, this is Nerva and Trajan. And one of the things that distinguished these emperors was that they were adoptive emperors. So, to characterize them, Paul picks Huiotesian. You know, this same text could have been inserted anywhere in the passage, and it would have the same meaning. But he's timing it to the emperors of that time. And this was the, the main characteristic of those emperors, is that they were about adoption. They adopted sons. Trajan was not Nerva's own son. Nerva comes into power, Domitian dies. Nerva comes into power right there. Aishui, that's 96 AD. That's when Nerva comes into power, and the first thing he does is adopt Trajan. And of course, Nerva doesn't stay in the power very long. Or maybe he came in... No, it was 96 to 98 for Nerva. So he comes into power there, Aishui, Otes. And then this is where Trajan comes in. That's how precise Paul is being. So when he gets here, this is where Trajan dies and Hadrian takes over. 
את האדה תלמטוס, תלה זה סאונד פליי און הי ווילס, you see, wills, he wills, your last will and testament, you will for somebody to be your successor. This is a kind of satire in wordplay Paul is using on Roman history. But now, at this point, he's tying it to Israel's history backwards. Because why? Because he's saying sonship into him for his own will and purpose. Well, when did his will and purpose begin? Back in Genesis? back when Israel left the land and of course at this point Hadrian in particular gets into wars with the Jews in this time so the Jews need to know how to characterize this time well what if the rapture occurs now what if the trib occurs now because from their perspective Hadrian starts to turn anti-semitic here and not without reason because the Jews are bucking him they're trying to get him to rebuild the temple and he's, he's putting them off and saying no and basically they misinterpret his no as a yes and because of that they start what ends up being called the Bar Kokhba rebellion all that starts right here so it's an appropriate place to tie it to Israel since that's when Israel is going to start making an issue of rebuilding the temple you see if you know the history and you know the meter and you know what year he's referencing then all you gotta do is look at the text and look at the history and it's like Oh my, this is an actor on a stage saying lines about that time in history and now it's going back to Israel. So he's, he's, he's um, what do you want to call it, threading together Rome's history, church history, and Israel's history to show what? To show how into his own delight, his own will and purpose will result in the glory of his grace. And of course at 133 here, that's the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And by 141, there's a pig temple standing called Iolia Capitolina. There's a pig temple standing on top of the Holy of Holies. And, and no Jew is allowed to enter. Okay? They're not allowed to enter the city. Graced us out, all right. Yeah, they're kicked out. Ekaritosin means to grace out, to overgrace. Yeah, they're kicked out. Only the apostates had remained behind. They're either dead or they're kicked out into diaspora. So you're out of Jerusalem, but you're in the beloved. And what is that? A 14. See, this is generation building from Jacob. Jacob was 21 years before he returned to the land. This is tribulational number, promise, seven okay so you got generation building tribulation likely generation building if the trib doesn't happen generation building half a vote half of 56 and then the pregnant 14 okay and that completes the first quarter of church history see he's now making a play on Noah as I covered before in the GGS videos. This is the spring of church. Okay? He's now going back to Noah, as we're going to see more when I get into episode 13. Okay? And so now we continue, and these are all AD years. So all I have to do, and I, I you know, um, where do you want to put it? The chrono chart. This is the chronology chart. These sources are all either contemporary Roman history on the internet, meaning in Latin or Greek, or, you know, everything you want to know about Rome is here. Or they're you know, modern Roman historians talking about it. And then in each verse, I track it, and these are links to each of the writers of the period or to the history of the period so that you can see the, the rye wordplay that is being used on Roman history and you can just link it and read it there and then if you want you can go back to each verse to see the Greek and I just you know specified out the keywords to show the the satire and you know how you can interpret it and how you can look at independent you know history on it from all over like this one is at uh, Chicago University University of Chicago rather and then this one 
is at uh, Evansville University. It called it Evansville, okay? And that one is at earlychristianwritings.com. So each one, this is from all over, it's whatever I could find that was most useful, you know, to help you, you know, clue into what Paul is actually playing on here, okay? So let's go back to verse 5. All right, so that's the first epinon. I mean, that's the first anaphora, and it wraps around the history of Israel. This is another one that's nested, and this is where we're getting into the epinon anaphora, interplaying with the Edokian anaphora, and all that complicated stuff about the 78 sevens, where I'll pick up again in uh, episode 13. But I'm going to walk you through the history real fast now. So we're now solidly into the tie with Israel, Rome, and church being threaded together. How does the future of Rome and the future of church, you know, relate to Israel? And what he's saying is, hi, here's the first quarter of church, and these are the characteristics of each year, and it's wry wordplay, basically saying that church is not doing her job right. But she keeps on getting chances to rebuild and vote, this is 157 A.D., 165 A.D., and it doesn't look really good for her because the 28s, just like they were in Isaiah, 28 means vote short. You're only even half voting the vote short. So Christianity, the church, Rome, the Jews, everybody's not, not listening too well to God right now. So that's why we get this pregnant 14, which always signifies a crucial critical change over time in history which of course it was because this is when Jerusalem goes down and now a pig temple okay is standing over the holy of holies which is just like the diaspora which is the same 14 that Daniel was praying about in Daniel 9 that's how bad it is that's how bad church is that's how bad Israel is <coughs> and that's how bad Rome ended up being because Hadrian, Hadrian at this point had died or was getting just about had just died and to Antoninus Pius took his place and Antoninus Pius was busy um, trying to revive Roman manners Roman gods Roman everything and um, he stopped a, a massacre that Hadrian had ordered just before he died so it was really bad for Rome too okay so then we get into the Marcus Aurelius years Okay, and then we get into commas. Okay, those aren't good years for Christians because they're still half a vote short. In other words, vote short is 56. That's like the diaspora, 49 plus 7. 56 is the total. And it's so bad in Christianity. There's just enough to keep time going, but it's not good. And that's why there is a commodus who comes to power as a teenager because Marcus Aurelius is just too dumb to live okay and he lets his own son be co-regent with him okay and then at this point we got another 56 which means all oh, the vote is really short and time is so bad that you're going to have tribulational quality time yeah because here's when Commodus dies and then there's this massive like little civil war going on here that results in the rise of the severans and one of the things that was re they were regarded as super abounding for the be benefactors of Rome because of the civil war that preceded it's unbelievable I go through the, the whole history in the GGS series and in the chrono chart on verse 8 okay you can just go through that or go back to the verse or go back to the chrono chart Okay, on verse 8, which is right here. This is where it gets into the severance, right in here. And you can look them up on the internet as you choose, okay? So that's basically how verse 8 goes, and that's the severance coming to power. And then here's his key word. Musterion, which Paul uses to mean pregnancy, which means women. And at this point in history, this is Caracalla, the women are behind the throne. 
Severus has died. Caracalla murdered his brother. He's taken his place. He's about to die with the connivance of the women. Past hidden content. Yeah, they're the hidden power behind the throne. And this is what produces them doing all kinds of little nasty stuff with their own kids. Okay. Macrinus rebels and takes over and beats the Severans temporarily. And then he dies. And the guy who was supposed to be his son, Dia Dumineos or something. I forget how to pronounce it. Okay. This is where the Severans get back in power. Macrinus has died at, at, at this point. And the Severans get back in power and they use their sons, Heliogabalus and Severus Alexander. And they get into power. And this is where Mother Church is born. And I did those videos on the bishop's list showing you that guy's dissertation where he proves a bishop list, the invention of Peter being at Rome as some kind of Pope Bishop guy. That was invented in order to discredit Origen by a guy named Demetrius of Alexandria whose cohort was Julius Africanus using another guy named Hippolytus, there were two of them, in Rome trying to convert the Severans who were in power beginning here to 17 to 18. Origen was in Rome at the time. They invented a pope list in order to make the Severans feel that, oh, see, Christianity is really a Roman religion. And this guy Peter was at Rome, see, he was our most important guy. They leave Paul off the list. It's hysterical. They invented it. Mother Church is born right here at Telemotos. And Paul's making fun of it. Past hidden content, yeah, power behind the throne, and the invention of Mother Church, pregnant according to their will, but not God's. But God's going to accomplish His will despite them. Of course, not without a little bit of problem. Because, see, vote is short here, baby. Absolutely short. So tribulation quality to clean out has to result. And that's exactly what this is. In 231 to 238, there was a massive persecution of Christians. Okay, it was kind of local and sporadic, and it was mostly by the mobs. But the guys who were trying to convince the Severans to turn to Christianity by inventing Peter as a pope, okay, the guy who that was the bishop in Rome at the time ends up getting killed. Hippolytus himself gets banished. And during these seven years, it was not good to be a Christian in Rome at that time. Not only that, but I have to say probably based on Paul's meter here, everybody in Rome was expecting the tribulation to start then. And I did links um, in 12C, episode 12C, where you can see that, you know, the, the debate that was going on about it. Because there are links on the internet about this. And this is called, in Roman historian terms, the crisis of the third century. It begins right here. And this was a period of persecution. Severus Alexander is killed during this time by his own troops. Uh, about here in see, five, 235. So, one, two, three, four. About there. Severus Alexander is killed. And then there's this massive civil war that goes on here. So Paul turns that into a 14 all standing by itself. The the summing up of history under church. Pleromatos is another pregnancy term of Paul's. Pleroma means to fill a ship or a woman. Fill up a ship or a woman. That's its provenance in Greek. The filling up of time's dispensation is a nickname for church. My pastor spent a lot of time going over this verse and explaining that. So if you think that Brano is just inventing this, I suggest that you get his 1985 Ephesians series. It'll take you seven years to go through because he teaches it every day for an hour a day from the Greek, starting in 1985, from the Bible, taking you all over the Bible to prove what he's saying. He did not know this meter, but he knew the doctrine of it, but he didn't know the meter. I found this out by mistake when trying to argue two years ago in December 2010 with 1689 Baptists 
And as soon as I was trying to figure out how to explain to him that we're elected in Christ, the election is Christ, not us. As soon as I was trying to figure out doing that, I looked up Ephesians in Greek to try to find where I could show it best. And, I'm, and I, I, the idea hits me, the Holy Spirit always does this. It's metered. And I'm like, what? And I didn't want to meter it. And the first time I did it, I did it wrong in order to argue with 1689 Baptists. And my life hasn't been the same since. All the stuff you're seeing now grew out of that. He's been showing me metered passages since 2008 with Isaiah. What can I tell you? The, the, you know, you don't have to believe me when I tell you he's telling me. Look at the math itself and prove it yourself, academically. Okay? Pretend that I'm making it up that he told me. I wouldn't look at it if he didn't tell me, but forget that. Look at the math yourself. I didn't invent these patterns. I didn't invent the Bible. I didn't invent the meter. And it goes all the way back to Moses, as you're hopefully saying. Okay, so that's the second quarter of church. So now we're at summer. That's the time of war. The summer of church, time of war. Yeah, and that's exactly what's going on. Crisis of the third century is the historical name for this. It was also a crisis for church because that was when Mother Church really started going under Origen and Irenaeus and all those other idiots that we laughingly call the church fathers. Yeah, they fathered apostasy, but honey, everybody was apostate then. Just pick your flavor. Happened to be the Catholic flavor was born here, hidden behind the throne, talking to the Severan mothers, trying to birth them into Christianity as those people thought of it. And what they birthed was civil war instead and that's what all this is. This is where the Decian persecution comes in. This is where Valerian and Gallienus come in, historically. Those are the names of the emperors. There were a lot of them in between I'm not mentioning. It was a free-for-all. It was a very dangerous time. So that's why it was a critical turning point in history. So Paul marks it off with the 14. Sorry this is taking so long, but I want you to see the thrust of this. Okay, that takes you to 260 AD. This is the end of Gallienus. Okay, and the rise of, um, I forget the guy's name. It's not Numerian Corinus, but it's their dad. And I forget their dad's name. Okay, but this is actually where our boy Diocletian it starts to, you know, be involved in the Roman military. And this is his rise to power. He actually comes to power here. Paul is benchmarking. And everything that Diocletian cared about was exactly what you see highlighted in English there. Diocletian wanted to sum up everything under himself. And he starts his rise to power under the successor to Gallienus. Okay, I forget, Val, Val, was it Valentinian? I forget the, the father's name. His kids' names were Numerian and Corinus. Corinus might have been the dad. But basically what happens is, this is the year that our boy Diocletian comes to power. This was his thought pattern. He, he, he had some gypsy tell him that, that he was going to be emperor. And he wanted to sum everything on heaven and on earth under himself. And it's due to Diocletian coming to power that Constantine will come to power. Okay, and I'm hoping that you know a little more about Constantine. So the whole rise of Diocletian is mapped here. Okay, 291, and then this is where he invents his persecution policy. So Paul marks it off. Church is so apostate that the persecution has to occur. And this is the famous Diocletian persecution. Paul's mapping it off. And it lasts from 301 A.D. to 308 A.D. Historically, you can look it up. It's called the Diocletian Persecution. And if you look in the chrono chart, again, that's the chrono chart here. I have a, I spent a lot of time on this one. I go through all the history of Diocletian. Because you got to see it. Because Paul is, Diocletian was all about foreordained and temple showbread and all that. He didn't call it temple showbread. God's temple showbread. It's, this is satire by Paul saying that we're being foreordained during the very period of Diocletian's rise, which is, you know, disaster for church. 
Most Bibles that were extant were destroyed during Diocletian's time. So I go through it sent year by year. Okay. See, Diocletian inherits. That's what he thought he was going to do. He thought that God said that he would inherit. You see, it's satire on the Romans. It's also satire on the church. Carus. Carus was the dad. Carinus was the son. I should have known that. Enus is a diminutive. Okay? So that whole time is mapped right here. Okay? That's the, the um, crisis of the third century, which isn't resolved until our boy Diocletian rises to power. Okay? And he thought he was supposed to inherit the earth. Okay? So, in whom even we inherit. Yeah. See, it's, it's a parallel. It's a play. It's satire. And yeah, we inherit time and trouble because church is so bad, she's like Israel in the direct diaspora. 49 means we're bad. And we're being parallel with Israel again. Meanwhile, this is when Diocletian dies just like Mark before and this is when Diocletian dies and that's when Licinius and and Ga well Gallienus was already uh, Galerius was already dead this is when Licinius and Constantine start to battle it out and from this time to this time is all Constantine Constantine dies at 337 which is right here this is really embarrassing I, I got to get the mouse to work. Constantine dies right there at Proel. The whole word is Proel Picotas and it means first fruits. Literally means first fruits. It's the sheev offering that Aaron had to wave before the Lord to begin the countdown of what the Jews today call counting the Omer, but the Jews count it wrong. It begins on the last day of Passover. Not the first day, the last day. Christ rises at after sundown, after the last day of Passover week, which ran Saturday to Saturday. He died on Good Wednesday. Christ is called first fruits for that reason. Okay, but not Constantine. Constantine dies at Proel. This is 337 A.D. He's being burlesqued by Paul in advance. Because, of course, it was under Constantine the church became an institution and persecuted the Jews. And I have lots of links proving all this that you can investigate yourself on the Internet, which, again, are in the chrono chart for this period. That's the link, chrono chart. And then you look up 320 to 334, and you can look up all these links about what happened. Okay? Sorry this is so involved, but it took me two years to write this up, and this now you know why. Okay, so now we go back to verse 11. So by the end of verse 12, you see highlighted in the darker blue there, that's 337 A.D., Constantine dies, and all of his kids start to murder each other and other Christians over whether God is one or three. And none of them have kids that survive. There is no fourth generation for them. They don't even get to the third generation. That's how bad they are. This is a condemnation of Constantine. And Paul ends his last anaphora <coughs> with Constantine for that reason. This is the ending of the Eudokian anaphora. This is the ending, or the middle, rather, of the Apinon Anaphora. It's so bad, the third quarter of church. <coughs> it's so bad that all you got is God's vote. Tribulation quality, Constantine, what if the rapture had occurred then? It could have, baby. If it doesn't, honey, ain't going to be a rapture for a very long time. Because the only one voting at this point, because church is so apostate under Constantine, that there's only a few first fruits, and Constantine ain't one of them, honey. Just like Caligula was Epu instead of Epuranias, Constantine is Proel instead of Proel Picotas. And the Proel Picotas 
are the few believers who from this point forward are developed into kings because God's voting for it. That's the end of the third quarter of church. So the fourth quarter of church ends with 434, which is when Odebacher rises to power. And you have all the dippy guys in between, you know, Honorius and Pulcheria and all those stupid idiots who are all fighting over whether God is one or three. And so that's where you have, you know, the vandals coming in and all that other stuff. And this is the rise of Odebacher right here. Rome, Western Rome is traditionally deemed to die in 476 AD. But Odovacher is just born. He's just been given a little prophecy that he's going to rise to power at that year. And that's where Paul cuts it. That's the final quarter of church. Now, what I don't know is whether this is 434 syllables, Daniel 7, 62nd week, the 56 again left out, just like Daniel left it out. Okay, what I don't know, I'm just checking to see if my recorder is still working. What I don't know is whether Paul's telling us that we start all the way back. Do we start back at, again, to do the next, you know, 490 years of church? Are the trends, because my pastor taught this for a long time, you can tell it from other verses. These are historical trends of church that repeat in these cycles? Is that what it is? Or is this last quarter just going to be the, the trend forever until church dies, until, you know, the rapture occurs? Is this final last quarter just going to characterize us? There's a lot to argue that this this latter is the ter interpretation because Daniel 9.26 is the time bubble that basically says that there's going to, like the Lord said in Matthew 24, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars until I come. There's just nothing but apostasy. It's only the few, the pro epicotas, and there's not even going to be a major growth spurt that you could block off like this. You won't even be able to do that. There'll be so few believers that are developing, growing up spiritually, that you've only got the few. And of course, that's what he's saying. We're the first fruits, and even you, even believing you were sealed, the Holy Spirit's your down payment, okay, into redemption for the praise of his glory. I mean, there's a lot more to it than this. But I just want you to notice, this is the beginning of winter. Autumn has ended. This is the winter of church. And I think, I'm not 100% sure yet, I think what Paul is saying is, hi, until the rapture happens, this is history for church. You can't tell when the rapture is going to happen. It's only about the few who are going to be developed. The masses will always be apostate. Now, it's pretty easy to draw that conclusion because that's the way history has gone. But maybe he's saying that the time units start all over again and it's the same kind of time trend as back when Christ was born. I'm not sure which. But at least now you can see what the significance is of that meter. This is Odovaca rising to power. Paul doesn't have to finish it. The last 56 years were in abeyance with Daniel. They were in abeyance with on a 28 that's even more pregnant with Isaiah. They were in abeyance with Moses. And they were in abeyance, of course, with Mary, because she was projecting. So Paul leaves them in abeyance, too. We're the 56 of history. Are we going to complete our vote so that the year of church completes or not? Nobody knows. God says it will complete, but when? It's a body criterion because Christ paid for X number of bodies on the cross with no promise as to how long that was going to take. The promises of the bodies. And if those bodies are not born and don't die on time or whatever time they die, then Satan can say, Hi God, it's a mistrial, I'm sorry. You presented in evidence on the cross in Christ X number of bodies, we heard them all get paid for. They're in the book of life until they're blotted out. But until the last one is born for church, 
then you've presented evidence and had your son pay for evidence on the cross that hasn't happened yet. And if, by the way, this winter doesn't complete, the bodies of church don't complete, then I'm sorry, you didn't keep your promise. I win, you lose, end the story. And you know what? If Satan does win, that will be true. What would happen if it were true? Well, that's up to you. Think that over with God, because I'm not sure of all the answers either. All I can tell you is, that's the 62nd week of history. That's Daniel 9.26. That's deliberate on Paul's part. It's the beginning of Odovacher for, for our real history. And only the few are being developed now. Peace out.